Hey everyone, this is Theodore, the lead biz ops from Zengate, and I also have uh, Joseph Arminio from the Rosenbridge team uh, with me. And we just want to give you an update of how things are going for the Fund 10 proposal, give you an overview of uh, how things started, how things are going right now. And we also want to talk about uh, Fund 11 proposal and hopefully answer some questions that the community has. We're going to do that uh, more often, and we're going to have uh, more of this content coming out, especially during the, uh, the voting period, to make sure that we're going to be answering all questions and at the same time, we're going to be uh, also keep hosting the AMAs uh, on Twitter space that uh, we keep hosting and we've been hosting for quite a while now. Uh, with that being said, Joe, I would like to ask you how Fund 10 proposal uh, is going so far. We obviously got the news that Rosenbridge is live. There's transactions happening. Uh, please give us just an overview of how things started and where we are right now. Sure. Uh, well, uh, let's start from the beginning, right? Uh, one thing that Rosen offers uh, and the part of why, uh, you know, we were encouraged to apply for Catalyst funds is this idea of providing additional revenue streams to uh, local operators, right? Uh, in the case of, you know, the Cardano ecosystem, that's going to be the SPOs, right? And so the SPOs are always going to be uh, somewhat reliant on whatever the network parameters are you know, just from like a profitability perspective, right? So, uh, you know, there's uh, quite a few single pools out there that, you know, it, it's kind of, a, let's just say full network based on the current parameters, right? And so you have certain people that are, you know, trying to uh, run local infrastructure that, you know, simply put, need additional revenue streams, you know, in order for that to be a viable business, right? And, you know, that's that's always kind of a, big question when it comes to decentralization is you have to have uh, incentive for distributed hosting, right? You know, whether you're talking about miners on proof of work or whether you're talking about, uh, you know, kind of the block production process and proof of stake networks, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's incentivized. And so there's always been this question, you know, long-term, okay, you have this group of local operators, uh, and, you know, what can be done to build kind of multi-services, right? And I, and I do think that, you know, if you look at a lot of uh, even miners and proof of work, you know, a lot of the times they will have kind of a complex operation with multiple revenue streams, right? And so, uh, you know, we were encouraged, hey, why, why don't we throw this out there, uh, see if we can use this set of users that are already online. You know, they're already pre pretty well connected in terms of block production. Some of them, uh, you know, have their own applications that they either support or work with or run infrastructure for. And why don't we see if we can use this as an initial set of operators to bootstrap uh, the Rosen framework? So we uh, started with a series of uh, workshops. Um, you know, part of that was trying to understand, you know, why Rosen? Uh, you know, sometimes people look at like what something can do and not necessarily how that gets accomplished. And oftentimes it's in the how that, uh, you know, security assumptions come into play. And that gets buried for, for like the end user, but Ultimately, when you're talking about trying to create resilient systems, uh, that how becomes critically important. So we started, uh, you know, going through the assumptions of Rosen and why that mattered. Uh, then we started to get into the kind of economic incentives involved, right? Uh, it's one thing um, when you're talking about like a distributed system to uh, look at like the inner mechanics of it and the security assumptions, but the economic assumptions are just as important. And in some cases, maybe even more so, right? There's some systems where I would say the uh, actual how it works is somewhat questionable, but the incentives are there. So there's an uh, incentive for participation and, you know, hopefully uh, that security issue doesn't pop up in the future, but in the meantime, it creates revenue for people, right? That's ultimately uh, what's quite important 
um, with these type of systems. So we did a series of workshops uh, going through kind of the mechanics, the incentives, and we got a lot of good feedback uh, from, you know, the stake pool operators out there. Uh, in the meantime, we were building, um, you know, open source code. We're uh, integrating into different uh, infrastructure on the Cardano side. Um, you know, we got to the point where we said, hey, we're going to do a uh, kind of live test, right? And so we uh, kind of are going through this Rosen light phase is what I would call it, which is all about network stability, um, you know, adjusting parameters, uh, improving the core software. And, you know, I, as a result of that, uh, you know, the bridge has become more stable. Uh, the software is uh, improving. And recently, I, th I think actually... Today, I'm not sure when this will uh, <laughs> drop live, but uh, today, you know, we expanded beyond kind of the core assets that uh, Rosen bootstrapped with to where uh, we did have some participation with uh, two meme coins, one on Ergo, one on uh, Cardano, uh, which is Comet and Hosky. And so uh, because in the testnet period, you know, we wanted to play around with other assets uh, beyond kind of the uh, core coins of both networks uh, we added them today and uh yeah we've been seeing them kind of move back and forth across the bridge which is cool to see and what a better way of using the worthless tokens that even if something bad happens which we're not really thinking that it will happen but no but you know in in, in previous in previous worth iterations, nothing so <laughs> yeah in, pre in previous iterations uh you know we were sending just low value amounts uh the fee parameters were you know set at basically zero because we didn't have that uh open network of watchers that we have now uh so you know that's probably been the most exciting is to see the community participation on both sides let's um, talk about that a little bit actually how was it when we you know especially when you first began to have you know that that thought oh you know we should do the rosen bridge but how the Cardano community will will perceive this and, you know, uh, will accept it. Because I remember you and I in the very beginning um, of, you know, putting the Fun 10 proposal together before we even submitted, that was a conversation that we had, you know, how things were th then in your head and how things are now. And give us some stats, if you don't mind, in terms of participation uh, from Cardano and the Ergo side, just so people can understand a little bit more. Sure. Well, you know, I've always wanted there to be this idea of a layer, um, it's it's a reporting layer, basically. That's what watchers do. Uh, it's an open layer to where um, anybody with the uh, collateral um, can join. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, forms you have to fill out or anything like that. It's simply an economic barrier. And I've always liked this idea of um, being able to potentially audit and report your own transaction. Right. So like if you're a project or you're a user out there, you have kind of a seat at the table in, in part of this framework. You know, it's kind of like if you're a miner, uh, you can send a transaction and in theory, mine your own block. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have uh, an element of oversight um, over a protocol. Right. Uh, now, and for me as well, I, I think it's really important to try to create um incentives across uh kind of that group of mechanics to where it makes sense for people to participate and that's ultimately what uh security is derived from in these type of systems right is that incentive so uh we release this uh software we release the initial parameters and to be honest i had no idea how many people would show up like if you were to go back and uh look at the I don't know, videos that we've made, the Twitter spaces I've made. My hope was that uh, on either side of the bridge, we would get 30. Mm -hmm. uh, that was like in my head, like the number that I was hoping for. Uh, you remember the proposal? We we Essentially, when we first submitted the proposal, there was actually, we had 30 and we got some comments from the community, from community members asking, oh, what, only for 30? And we're like, no, 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 but, you know, that's our hope. And obviously we're yeah. going to open it up. You uh, never, you, you, know, you never yeah. know how many people are going to come, come into a new network like this, right? Yeah. A new protocol like that. So 
that was my hope. I was like, okay, if we can get 30, that's pretty solid assumptions. At that point, you've passed something like Binance Smart Chain, um, you know, in, in terms of like the distribution and, you know, with something like this, uh, I think there's probably better assumptions that it's not just like one person that's running multiple instances on their PC, which is sometimes the case uh, in crypto where it's like, we have this, you know, distributed system. And at the end of the day, it may, might be one server running multiple instances. Um, so, you know, we uh, released the software um, and yeah, the community really showed up. Uh, I think they did a better job collectively in terms of teaching each other to manage and operate this software than even the core team did. <laughs> and so we really, uh, man, in like a week, two weeks, we hit our current threshold, right? And so basically, um, because we're operating on Ergo and because reporters are, our watchers are reporting on chain, um, we have... Uh, data limit within boxes. Now we can, uh, you know, rebuild that to where um, that is reported across a series of boxes. And that's currently what we're working on um, building. And then we'll, you know, test it and then ultimately upgrade it. So we'll <clears throat> expand the uh, actual like limit of the watcher set. But within a week or two, we we hit our maximum capacity in terms of like the storage requirement of of the blockchain. So we did have a solution in place, but it was one of those things where I was like, well, you know, let's hope for 30. We have our solution there. And, you know, once once we hit that data limit, uh, you know, we can kind of work to scale uh, the amount of watchers the network supports. That happened a lot quicker than I anticipated, <laughs> right? Um, it, it's, it's part of the beauty and the chaos of having... Uh, like open participation in an ecosystem is, you know, you make plans and then uh, it may, you know, <laughs> depending on factors you do not control, maybe your roadmap and plan works out, or maybe you have to reshuffle things to uh, keep up with demand. But ultimately, I think demand is a good problem to have. I think it's really important for everyone to understand a little bit more around Fund11, you know, what's around the EVM ecosystem, uh, bridging with Cardano, and of course, Ergo, and what that will bring to the to the Cardano ecosystem in general. What's the ROI? Why people should vote? Why people should care? And in the yeah, end why? of the day, one of the biggest questions that we get is, can we use other bridges that they're out there right now, such as one chain to name a few, or maybe sure. Milko Meta? What, like, what's the difference there? And again, like, I think that's quite important for everyone to have that in mind. Well, let's let's start with kind of the ROI and what it offers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once the bridge uh, was live, um, and Rosen moved into the Cardano ecosystem, right? I took it upon myself to say, okay, I now have a, a Cardano native token, right? I have a native asset in Cardano. I had never um, actually talked with a lot of the exchanges. Uh, other than I've made a couple of introductions for projects, I, you know, just because they've asked for contacts, but I've never actually like talked to exchanges about integrating and supporting a Cardano project, right? I've, I'm from the Ergo side. I've always only talked about let's integrate the Ergo network. Now, like from an engineering perspective, uh, integrating a network into exchange is a lot more complicated than adding a native asset, right? Um, you know, you have to uh, kind of create a specialized node, you have to create a scanner, you have to build it into their system. Uh, because what a lot of people don't realize is that based on the structure of exchanges, um, exchanges are one wallet, right? So everything that happens within the exchange happens in their own internal database on top of that wallet and not necessarily on chain, okay? Um, now, once you have that infrastructure in place, um, basically, all you need to do is you need to add the uh, capacity to scan for an additional asset, right? It's very similar to how your wallet as a user works, where, you know, you kind of scan for everything and exchanges uh, just based on, you know, their performance, they don't really want to scan for everything when they want to scan for what they support, right? 
so I, you know, uh, went through a list of exchanges and said, Hey, you know, I, you know, I now kind of represent the Cardano ecosystem. Um, you know, give me an idea of what the cost is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I would say that in 95% of the cases, it's the same. Oh, wow. It's the same. It's the same price sheet I was looking at from the ergo side, right? Mm. And I, I understand, uh, like the engineering lift, that which are are totally, uh, you know, asymmetrical, right? Um, so what does that tell me, right? That that tells me that every project that's building on Cardano is going to hit a uh, economic barrier in terms of exchange listings, right? And it's the, it's pretty much the exact, uh, the exact ob obstacle that I faced representing Ergo, right? And I, I can tell you because, well, the Ergo Foundation's uh, treasury is open and it's on chain. The single largest expense of the Ergo network has actually been paying exchanges to support open source software, right? Yeah. So what what does that mean, like practically speaking, for the Cardano ecosystem as a whole, right? Is that the cost of accessing um, market liquidity is going to drain a lot of value from the ecosystem? You know, it's going to require projects to say, okay, well, if you're going to list across a group of exchanges, uh, you're going to need to raise. You know, depending on the quality of the exchanges, which is its own spectrum <laughs> in the crypto space, uh, you're probably going to need to have a multi-million dollar budget for each individual project if you want to uh, access, um, you know, uh, I would say a broad set of exchanges. That's problematic to the ecosystem as a whole because it shifts the focus away from actually uh, developing and building you know, unique frameworks to kind of this idea of paying for market access. And then, you know, your budget is going to take a hit. So you're going to have to counter trade against your own community to recoup the costs of market access. Right. And that is a uh, barrier that's, you know, it just, just, just distracts from actually building Unique and useful things, right? Building your product and spending your your funds to you know where you should be spending your funds. Yeah, yeah. So so if if most pro projects are going to hit that same cost barrier, we have a problem, in my opinion, right? Uh, to where the it's like the future of of Cardano in terms of what you can actually build upon it is going to be controlled by a very small subset of parties and the truth of the matter is if you look at most of them how many of these exchanges are running a validator for eth right mm -hmm. how many of them you know have have vested interests um that are not in alignment with the growth of cardano in some cases i would say you'll find they're actually more of a direct competitor mm -hmm. you know in, in terms of uh you know what they represent and where they generate revenue from and so there's a certain um, asymmetry in terms of incentives there, right? So then the question is, okay, what do we do? We need to find alternative means to, uh, you know, uh, allow projects to access market liquidity, right? And the truth is exchanges are not very resilient. Uh, you know, in the last two years, We've seen major issues with major exchanges. Some of them get kicked out of the U.S. Uh, some of them get hacked. Uh, some of them just steal customer funds. If you look at like FTX, uh, you know, and and so that also creates its own liability, right? So if you look at it from like a liability perspective of a project, if you're giving uh, in exchange funds, you're trusting that you know a they're operating. Um, with integrity, which you can't see. Uh, B, you're taking on this legal uh, liability in terms of, you know, how they operate, the jurisdictions they operate in. Um, there's a lot of trust that that you're putting in there, and and so, you know, my 
uh, view has always been, can we create something that A, is more resilient um, and B, has better assumptions, right? Because ultimately, you know, there there is trust and cost involved in, in that process. And so, you know, the goal with Rosen has always been to create a gateway for projects, right? To where projects can use Rosen to access uh, liquidity on chain in multiple environments. Um, now, if you talk about different uh, bridge solutions, you know, you have atomic swaps, you have smart contract bridges. To be honest, I support uh, research development and growth um, across uh, multiple frameworks there. I, I think that, you know, you have uh, good options. It's just a question of complexity, right? Because ultimately, you know, it's not necessarily what you can do, it's how you do it. Mm -hmm that matters you know so my goal um has always been to create uh an avenue where liquidity can move from you know one blockchain to another in a more seamless way and and a method that is relative you know it's transparent you can see you can understand how does it work because most of the time that's just hidden so that's i mean that's ultimately the problem that we need to solve like I understand, uh, you know, this idea of like uh, competition between projects on an ecosystem. But when you're talking about net friction from that ecosystem to grow, you know, you, we need all alternatives based on the like the normal path, in my opinion. We live in a really weird world when it comes to money, right? And ultimately, cryptocurrencies are money systems, right? So you take, I don't know, $100, you go to the bank, you deposit it. What's the first thing that happens? They loan out your money. Yeah. Like like that that rehypothecation of money is so ingrained in our financial system people don't even question it, right? You know, you take something and then you lend it and so now it's backed by, you know, hopefully somebody that pays it back, right? Um what Rosen does is it creates a one to one ratio. Um where if you use the Rosen bridge, you know, you have the lock token, you have the wrap token, and you have a transparent mechanism where you can see that your asset is not rehypothecated. Okay. If you deposit your asset into an exchange, it's in a single wallet. So you can see what is happening in terms of the inflows and the outflows, but you cannot see what's happening with how that is being moved around and indexed uh, in that wallet. So there is a possibility and FTX, you know, is a very clear example of that where, you know, the actual assets um, were rehypothecated uh, and essentially put at risk lost, right? But from the user perspective, all they have to do is cover withdrawals, right? A bank can be totally insolvent but if they can cover their withdrawals, they don't necessarily have a problem because nobody can see their internal balance sheet, right? And Rosen actually prevents this because there's no uh, rehypothecation. Uh, there's no leverage involved. It's just one-to-one. -one. And so it creates uh, more honest data. And I'll, I'll give an example, okay? So if I move uh, an asset cross-chain, I put it on a decentralized exchange, right? Every trade is on chain, so it comes with a cost, right? So it becomes more honest data because in order to move something, you have to pay a transaction fee. If I put something in a wallet, it's not necessarily on chain, but it's being reported as trading data. There's an ability for exchanges to set their own maker taker fees, right? in terms of how internal trading um, has a cost associated with it. Well, in essence, if you have a zero cost trading environment, it sets up a uh, an environment where you can manipulate that because there is no cost associated with trading. And so then you get into this idea of wash trading and false statistics, which is problematic in the cryptocurrency industry because... Um, you know, you've created this environment where you can move money 
inside one wallet between two accounts that are indexed. And there's no cost to do that or minimal cost. Uh, and again, that's a parameter that exchanges themselves set versus when you trade on networks, you have the transaction fee. You actually have um, a cost associated with moving money. So you get a much more accurate um, picture in terms of the actual uh, movement of assets and uh, volume in an ecosystem, right? And so in my opinion, doing that on chain is simply better for that reason, because it's true. You could in theory pay for like, you know, I'm going to trade this and trade that and trade, but there's an economic burden that's passed on to uh, present false data, right? And if you do it in an environment where that burden is minimized or non-existent, you cannot trust that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So separating separating that ability to rehypothecate or create leverage, in my opinion, is really important because it creates this environment um, for better data. You know, people right now don't trust bridges, right? Let's just be honest. Like this oh, is this is like for the, good reason. For good reason, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Obviously, yeah. They have a, they, and they have a, yeah. Obviously, a lot of reasons for that. But About like two billion. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of the transparency and everything else that comes with it, I think people right now start value more quality in terms of, you know, instead of speed or, or instead of like, you know, trust me, bro, kind of situation. Well, it goes, um, it goes, it goes back to what I said. A lot of people focus on what you can do, not necessarily how. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the how that all of your security assumptions are going to be derived from. Uh, that's just a failure of the space, in my opinion. You know, you can look at, at past uh, exploits where, you know, something is marketed in a certain way and they say, okay, well, you know, it's totally trustless. And if you look at the actual points of failure, um, you know, in some cases, it's like a two of four multi-sig, right? It's, it's not so trustless in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... What Rosen has tried to do is to be very transparent about how the system operates, right? Because that's ultimately going to be uh, what is securing all of the assets in the bridge. Um, and, and yeah, I think that, you know, uh, sunlight is always the best disinfectant, right? So if you can see inside a system, uh, you'll have a much greater ability to understand uh how it operates right when you get into the black box uh scenario um you know a lot of people love to talk about what things can do not necessarily how they do it because you can't see under the hood you know and in, in, in cryptocurrency is ultimately uh an alternative money system right and the truth is if we look at the traditional uh financial system as it exists today, it has not really caught up with the digital era, in my opinion. You know, I'll, I'll use the example of, um, let's just say audibility. And we still are in an era where, you know, if you have a public, let's say a publicly traded company, something that's a public good, you know, you report what? Quarterly, right? Mm -hmm. And that came from a paper era. It came from an era where you had to have, you know, some guy with some paper and pencil and, you know, maybe a spreadsheet and could print it and you would accumulate all this data and then you would submit it. Right. Well, we're moving into a world where um, the ability to index and parse information could create real time auditability. Now, the truth is that might really create a lot of problems in our financial system, because if you had real time transparency instead of you know, quarterly transparency with accounting tricks, um, you know, it, we might see some massive shifts in terms of how um, securities, commodities, et cetera, are valued. But offering that type of transparency to the public, in my opinion, would create better price data and better accountability. And then we could also ask the question, well, in theory, what if you could do the same and apply it to governments? right to where governments are supposed to be a public good um how come we can never see you know the money flows through them 
we certainly have the technology to create that, but uh, that's usually the last thing that they would actually support. Um, so it, it's one of those things that if if you had that level of transparency, it would disinfect a lot of things, but disinfection kind of creates a certain death and release of toxic shit, right? So, uh, you know, it's it would be a very disruptive change, but ultimately... Uh, if we look at like these type of monetary systems from first principles, it would create a better environment for trust. Mm. And that's ultimately um, one of the most important aspects of the cryptocurrency movement as a whole. Now, it's true on the fringes, you get into like this idea of like speculation and gambling and just complete madness. It's crypto, baby. But in terms of core principles, um, a lot of that has to do with understanding the security assumptions of systems, the distribution of control in systems, and the ability to uh, transparently audit in real time, yeah. independently, right? That's powerful. Yeah. And so, you know, for Rosen, yes, it's it's kind of its own unique bank is the only way to describe it. That would be my actual next question. And I think it's quite it's quite an important one. So people can understand a little bit more of the vision because you talked about, you know, centralized exchanges, listing fees, how to keep liquidity within the ecosystem as much as possible and not just give it up to a centralized exchange, put it in a wallet. And, you know, it's actually been, like you said, drained out of the ecosystem right now. Mm -hmm. it, is Rosen going to be an open source, decentralized, cross-chain exchange? If, in a if, way, if I can put it, you know, in a yeah, in, in, in a way, yeah. like if I were to sit down with grandma, yeah, exactly. Thank if you. I were to sit, <laughs> if, I were, if I were to sit down with grandma and explain what is Rosen, okay, um, I, I would probably start with like banking, okay. So you know, a, a long time ago, <laughs> you know, you had this ability to to like deposit gold, right? And because gold's heavy, you don't want to carry it around everywhere. It's not very efficient. Uh, you would get a claim, right? You know, and so they'd say, okay, well, if you take this claim to the bank, it's redeemable for the asset, okay? Um, that works until the person that's running the vault realizes that they can have more paper claims than there is gold. All they have to do is be able to cover the withdrawal, right? They can cover the withdrawal the trust assumption that people will have is there's, you know, enough gold in there to be able to cover all of the claims of receipts. And that's not always the case. Right. And so what happens in financial systems where, uh, you know, you have a mass withdrawal, uh, well, you get a bank run. Right. And even in the United States, you could look at something like Silicon Valley Bank where, you know, because they had rehypothecated a lot of their money, invested it elsewhere, they got into this scenario where they're having to sell um, where they had invested uh, at a loss to try to cover withdrawals. Because if they couldn't cover withdrawals, you know, they're basically uh, going to fail as a business, right? And then, well, in the end, they kind of did, right? And well, you know how it goes no accountability. But so what does Rosen do? It gives you real-time access to um, audit independently each particular vault, right? So you can know that nothing has been rehypothecated. Uh, there's not more receipts than assets, right? And in order for a transaction to clear through the Rosen framework, it has to go through a complex method of um, redundant auditing. Right. To where, you know, if, if I want to move a transaction today uh, on Rosen, it's got to go through the watcher set. Right. So it's going to be independently reported, you know, uh, what, 40, 50 times before it reaches a threshold and then goes into the settlement process. And, and that type of trust um, is important because, you know, it, the truth is you FTX is the perfect example of this. When you mix this ability to 
hold assets as well as rehypothecate them, create leverage, um, and seek yield. A lot of the times, um, you know, money is being moved and used in multiple places at once. And so when somebody comes to withdraw it, it may not settle. It may not be there. Um, you know, and I cannot say whether or not that's common practice because I cannot see. Yeah. You know, uh, like I know that um, there's a lot of people that would say, well, you know, you need to defend all of the businesses in the crypto industry because they're a part of your industry. I totally disagree with that. You know, I can defend what I can see. There's a lot of black boxes in this industry that I simply cannot see. And so, like, from my perspective, I cannot trust what I cannot see. You know, so creating a system where you have a redundant network of parties that are continuously looking, seeing, and reporting uh, is a beneficial thing. When are we going to see other Cardano native tokens, such as, let's say, Indy or WMT? Obviously, when we see those tokens listed, maybe tell us, you know, walk us through maybe what the process is. How does that work? And when do you think that we're going to see more Cardano native tokens coming on Rosen main, I'd say, <laughs> when that time comes? So I'm going to start honestly, okay? One of the beauties and upside and downside to actually having distribution in network is I'm not in control, mm -hmm. right? And I have to I have to be you know transparent in that. I I do not have like absolute control over the network. It has to be a collective consensus. Um, now, this is my plan. Okay. Uh, first is I have all of the price sheets of. Well, pretty much the majority of exchanges. So I'm aware of what the actual costs are in terms of um, listing at exchanges. You know, what is the cost of liquidity? Many projects are, but most of the time that's non-disclosure agreement, right? You don't want to leak that. It's it's kind of a secret in the industry. It's just is what it is. It's not public facing. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to make that public facing. Why? Because transparency matters. Um, now, one nice thing about Rosen is that as it scales, the assets that uh, support, um, you know, the Rosen framework will scale as well, right? So, you know, if you uh, join as a project now, we're, you know, still in our infancy, right? So you have access to Ergo. You know, that's not necessarily like the sexiest thing long term. So we need to uh, keep that assumption in mind. But there's also a lot of uh, exchanges where the liquidity on them is questionable. Right. You know, you can look at uh, like the Ergo ecosystem and say, well, if you're listed on a uh, chain, you now have the ability to be accessed by any user or miner that participates in the Ergo network. And I would actually say that from like a user-based perspective, that's bigger than a lot of exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, now, you also get this incentive where let's say we open our bridge to Ethereum, you now have access to you know probably the largest on-chain uh, market in the world. And you know then we can go through different ecosystems and look at like the user-based potential and the amount of liquidity on-chain that could potentially access your project, right? So it, it creates a certain synergy in terms of growth potential. Now, um, in terms of uh, cost, that's not something I control. I think that it's something that would be wise to scale with the cost of liquidity that already exists, right? Because there's already an existing business model there, right? And and the truth is, I, I think that uh, it's interesting to see you know, what, what is the incentive there in terms of profit distribution, right? Uh, because when you look at uh, the barrier of entry um, and you just pay an exchange, right? Uh, you know, I cannot say whether or not they're counter trading against you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really can't say, I can't see. Um, in terms of profit distribution, it creates this idea of building your community, right? So it, it creates a broader set of actors that are aware of your project, uh, maybe supports your project. I think it's it's much more in alignment with 
like a community oriented asset versus, you know, pay them and hopefully they don't abuse their position of power. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is, you know, most exchanges will operate where they have exchange agents, right? And they're, uh, it's a commission-based job, usually runs 5 to 15% in terms of the actual uh, commission costs. I guess you could look at it somewhat like a realtor or something. And so they'll go around to projects and they'll try to uh, get you to fill out the application. Um, you know, they'll take their little application, they'll submit it to a team that then reviews your project and says, okay, you know, what are some of the basic current parameters and uh, liabilities that we would inherit from this project? And, you know, then they'll go and they'll say, okay, well, we have liquidity requirements, we have market making requirements. Um, and, you know, they'll send you back a package in terms of the listing costs, right? I'm familiar with that. I've, I've had to deal with that. You know, so I, I think there are certain aspects of um, that business model that are applicable, right? You know, it's like, okay, we have this idea of guards and watchers. What if we created a, a you know, an idea of like a hunter or somebody that is incentivized to go, um, you know, support Rosen and, you know, teach projects about what we do and get some sort of incentive from that, right? And that, already exists i don't necessarily think we need to reinvent the wheel um you know if you're talking in terms of like distribution you know especially if you get into this idea of i don't know sometimes you get like meme coins are popular in crypto and it like again i don't have control so you have to take whatever i say you know as my own opinion that i can't enforce um but then it's like okay well if you have like a meme coin that you know exists and they want to participate say hosky even like there's some neat um incentives that could be created in terms of uh building community right um you know in terms of asset distribution which you know sometimes is very sketchy when it comes to like that that type of project um it could be a way to grow uh so you know, I, I do think that probably um, from a technical side, it makes sense to me to have the ability to scale watchers before we start, you know, integrating new assets, um, you know, and, and that's currently a work in progress. Uh, you know, a lot of the times I get asked win, win, win. And, you know, it just depends on testing, right? Uh, it's a, You don't set a date, you make it work first. <laughs> <laughs> um but but we will have an open discussion, right? And I want an open discussion in terms of realistic pricing. I want an open discussion in terms of profit distribution to where, you know, you could even create a scenario where we create a staking mechanism, right? Where if you lock Rosen um, in one place, you'll generate a portion, you know, a portion of the listing fees will go to you. We could always use that as a means of like airdropping assets that are supported, right? That's something that exchanges do uh, very commonly to try to build community is, is a part of their market integration fee will be we want X, you know, value of your token. And then we're going to airdrop it within our community to try to incentivize users to use our exchange, right? Again, why do I need to re recreate the wheel? There's already a lot of different, uh, different you know, uh, let, let's say business plans that I'm aware of and they work. Um, you know, then you could also say like from a marketing perspective, is there, you know, usually exchanges will space their listings, um, you know, one to two weeks. And so when they add a new asset, they'll go through a period of marketing online and, uh, you know, you get an AMA and you get this and, you know, so again, I don't think that we necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. Is this something that the conversation that will happen between the set of guards? Are the watchers involved? Yeah, Do you yeah. Mind that, explaining I, that I, a little bit. I think that ultimately you're going to have different. Uh, yeah, you have different competing interests, but they all have an incentive to grow, mm -hmm. right? And so that needs to be the common point of conversation and is market pricing, distribution, uh, and then supporting services, right? And for me. Uh, I've always found it valuable to uh, work within an ecosystem, right? If we're going to create peer-to-peer -peer economies, 
and you can't create your own internal economy, you've already failed. Right. So I think there's a lot of different uh, services um, that, you know, potentially the Rosen uh, framework can use from within its existing community that then amplify and kind of act as a force multiplier for the value that it adds to projects that list. Right. So I, I would love to see that. I would love to see it like watchers say, hey, you know, I, I can, you know, handle some of the marketing side for new assets, assets or, you know, perhaps I can be part of the business development in terms of going out and, uh, you know, educating new projects and adding, um, you know, new tokens to this framework. Uh, it depends what what skills people offer. I think we have the ability with profit distribution to create transparent incentives. And that's one thing I don't necessarily like about a lot of the crypto industry is that, um, you know, how many people knew that when you pay for an exchange listing, five to 15% of it goes to somebody who's paid on commission. Not too many. That's like you you get into like the secret sauce, the non-disclosure agreements that, you know, you cannot really see or know. And so it creates a real question. Like if you can't see that information, can it be used against you? I would say yes, to be honest. Like you have projects every once in a while that they pop up and on day one, they're listed everywhere. They have this professional marketing machine behind it. And, you know, people are like, oh, wow, oh my goodness. Well, what did that cost? And who paid for it? And what's their profit incentive, right? You get into like the Ponzi-nomic side of the crypto industry, which unfortunately tends to attract exit liquidity, right? Versus if you have fair transparent business practices you have transparent payments you have a transparent system it's going to disinfect a lot of shit that exists in this industry and for some reason people perceive that as something weird because everyone is so used to you know getting getting exactly what you described well, this, and, this is, and when you see the legit stuff you're like wait why why is this like that like this is why you know what at i mean the, <laughs> at the at the at the end of the day this is a tool that we all need number one right so if, if it's going to be a public good, it needs to have principles that serve the public. You know, if it's going to be a private enterprise, then yeah, you, you know, you can do whatever you want, but have the assumption that, you know, it, it's a private enterprise for private purposes and, uh, you know, private profits. I, I, I don't necessarily have an issue with that. I simply don't like where there's not conciseness in terms of what something is. And so my goal with Rosen has always been, we need to make this a public good because a lot of the institutions and businesses in this industry pretend to be a public good when they're not right. The assumptions are not there where I can say, okay, you know, this is transparent. It's kind of for the good of everybody, you know, it's open source. So, you know, it can be rebuilt and improved and it's a public good. It's for everybody, you know, they can choose to use it or not. But um, I think that, Applying that principle in practice is probably one of the most important things because, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about rebuilding money systems, right? Yeah. And you know, when you when you get into like the assumptions of a uh, financial system, you need that. Otherwise, it's an attack vector every time. Uh, Joe, I think you gave us a lot of information, really insightful video, and I just want to thank you so much for for coming on having this conversation making sure that the community has all the information they need and like what i said in the very beginning we're going to continue doing that um just to make sure that you know all the questions that the community might have uh have been answered hopefully we can get a lot of people supporting the fun 11 proposal that we submitted because i really believe it's going to be groundbreaking in terms of you know, getting into new, um, well, not new, but getting into the EVM um, ecosystems where the fun is, where the liquidity is, where the money is, well, where I, other projects want to go. <laughs> my hope is that, honestly, it moves both ways, right? Yeah. Not, only, not only do um, Cardano projects get access to uh, new market liquidity, but they also open the door for new collateral. And that makes, you know, the, the Cardano system's own internal uh, DeFi frameworks more powerful, right? You know, I could say like, 
you know, one thing I was, I was really, you know, I guess grateful, happy to see is that like liquid was like, Hey, we're going to support, uh, you know, Rosen based ergo. Right. Well, you know, how cool would it be to see them, you know, support Rosen based ETH or a variety of other, you know, assets, um, that then, you know, start to become collateral within, you know, some of the services that Cardano offers, right. It, it creates not only growth in terms of market access but that collateral could be powerful um and you know my goal is to say okay well if you're going to create collateral you need to make sure that it's backed one to one it has to be and you know it's so common that people deposit money in their bank it's lent out it's you know rehypothecated put at risk invested somewhere else and people don't necessarily have the assumption their money it might not be there um, we got to get rid of that assumption because it's toxic. It creates a uh, environment where it builds, you know, like it builds leverage that ultimately blows up every time. Give it enough time, you know, the uh, risk appetite of people will abuse that situation, and at some point, it'll be a problem. And that's a part of why we see such volatility and, uh, you know. I guess assets over time is because, you know, sometimes there's not, there's not a principle that says, okay, if you're going to create risk and leverage, we need to isolate it so that if it blows up, it doesn't create a systemic problem. Um, and that's ultimately what Rosen is trying to do is you can still go and, you know, leverage your asset and take your own risk and blow yourself up if you want, but it'll still be backed one-to-one -one by whoever uh, ultimately settles and ends up with that collateral. That's important. Well, Joe, thank you so much again um, for joining and for having this conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that the community will get, you know, all that information um, and get to understand more about the vision, about you know where we are right now and where we're going to uh, hopefully go within 2024. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for for joining us on this conversation. And we're going to be back uh, quite soon with more updates around Rosen. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.